Over 70% of our planet's surface is covered by water, meaning that while it is a terrestrial planet, Earth isn't really all that fitting a name. Almost all the water we have here is contained within the oceans, and the creatures that live there have fascinated me for as long as I can remember. So without further ado, let's take a deep breath and dive right in. A sea is a body of water that is relatively shallow when compared to an ocean, and is at least partially surrounded by land. There is some debate over the definition, and some, like the Caspian Sea, are often considered lakes because they're completely landlocked. There is, however, no debate over the number of oceans on our planet. There are five, namely the Arctic, Southern, Indian, Atlantic, and the largest of them all, the Pacific. Seas and oceans are compartmentalised by depth into layers called zones. At the top we have the sunlight zone, otherwise called the epipelagic layer, the prefix epi meaning over or on top of, and the word pelagic referring to the open ocean. This is the layer we're most familiar with, it's where coral reefs exist and it's where we usually observe most pelagic fish, even ones that dive into the depths, like basking sharks, which we normally see swimming just below the surface. They do this with their mouths wide open, filter feeding on plankton, but it looks like they're simply basking in the heat of the sun, and that misconception is where they got their name from. 200 meters down we have the mesopelagic twilight zone, meso meaning in the middle. Not much sunlight can reach all the way down here from the surface, and many fish use it as a sort of refuge, hiding in its darkness from open ocean predators like marlin, which rely on their eyesight to catch prey. In fact, it's now thought that the twilight zone is the richest and most biodiverse habitat out there, being home to more organisms than all the other oceanic habitats combined. A thousand meters down and we enter the midnight zone. Day and night no longer visibly pass down here, as sunlight cannot travel this far through water. This layer is called the bathypelagic zone, and it reaches as far down as around 4,000 meters, which is as far as any sea on the map goes. For a reference, you could stack nine Empire State Buildings on top of each other, starting from the sea floor, and the ninth spire wouldn't even breach the surface. And yet, this isn't the end. It's but the point where oceans are differentiated from seas, being deeper still with an abyssal layer. Between 4,000 and 6,000 meters, the abyssopelagic zone is, in most places, the deepest the ocean goes. But there are areas that reach even further down, relatively narrow chasms that can be as deep as 11,000 meters from the surface. These are the trenches, categorized as their own layer called the Hadal Zone, a layer so deep that you could place Mount Everest down here and the summit wouldn't even breach the twilight zone. For the longest time it was thought that no life could exist down there. The pressure alone is over a thousand times that of the surface, and there are no plants where there is no sunlight. Deep sea ecosystems instead thrive off of marine snow, a sort of organic dust that falls from higher layers of the ocean. It's eaten by zooplankton, jellyfish, and other filter-feeding animals who are then themselves eaten by their own predators, and so on. You might think that not enough marine snow would be able to make it through the midnight zone to support any life in the trenches, yet not only were crustaceans like prawns and amphipods found down there, but in 2008 a school of fish was discovered swimming at a depth of 7,700 meters, being the deepest living fish on record at the time. They were named ethereal snailfish, and they still hold the record to this day, now found at depths below 8,000 meters from the surface. It seems there's nowhere on earth too extreme for life. Animals of the deep sea are often pale, because when there's no sunlight, vibrant colours aren't needed for camouflage, courtship, nor deterring predators. The priority lies instead in remaining hidden. However, life at the surface is very different. Moray eels, for example, are covered in colourful patterns to camouflage in coral reefs, something that's undoubtedly important for an ambush hunter. Although with that being said, they have been observed actively chasing prey as well. You see, moray eels have a big problem. While their slender, slime-covered bodies can weave through cracks and crevices in the reef, the small fish they prey on have a size and speed advantage, and can quickly escape to open space if they see an approaching eel. Groupers have the opposite problem. They can easily catch fish out in the open, and yet they're too big and bulky to fit into any small spaces. They each succeed where the other struggles, and so the solution is obviously to work together. A hungry grouper approaches a giant moray's cave, shaking its head to signal that it wants to hunt together. The moray agrees to it, and they swim alongside each other, searching for food. When the grouper loses prey into the coral, it performs a headstand, essentially pointing to where the prey has gone. That way, the moray knows where to go, either to make a catch for itself, or failing that, flush it back into the open space where it's vulnerable to the grouper again. 
Sometimes the grouper gets the reward and sometimes the eel does, but either way, teamwork makes for much more efficient hunting. Behaviour like this has started a lot of discussion about fish intelligence. Now, it's hard to draw any reliable conclusions because intelligence isn't a single objective quality that can be measured directly, but some fairly indicative qualities are memory, learning capacity, and sociality. And so far, fish have demonstrated exceptional patterns in all three. Redwan Bashari, a professor at the University of Neuchâtel, conducted a series of experiments on groupers, like the ones he observed hunting cooperatively with moray eels. They were similar to those tests done on crows and parrots, where the desired behaviour is rewarded with food. He reported surprise at both how quickly the fish learnt what behaviour would be rewarded, and how accurately they would replicate that behaviour when prompted. And the story doesn't end there with groupers and eels. In 2011, a tusk fish was recorded using a rock as a tool to crack open the shell of its prey. This was the first example of tool use ever to be documented in wild fish. Likewise, sharks have continually demonstrated curiosity and an aptitude for social interactions. Some have even formed attachments to humans. This is Emma, a tiger shark who lives off the coast of the Bahamas, and she seemingly recognised a specific diver and the sound of his boat after the two had been separated for over a year due to the pandemic, which is testament not only to her memory, but also her need for sociality. They are not as mindless as we once thought. Fish aren't the only ones to call the ocean their home. In fact, every single class in the animal kingdom, be it reptiles, mammals, or even birds, have managed to thrive in the world of water. This makes sense when you consider that life began in the ocean, or at least it's widely believed that it did about 3.7 billion years ago. As far as I'm aware, it's still the realm of religion as to why it happened, but as for the how, the Miller-Urey experiment in 1953 gave a good insight. They conducted a closed system that mimics the conditions of Earth's early atmosphere, containing steam as well as other simple molecules like methane, hydrogen, and ammonia. They also placed electrodes in to shock the system, simulating lightning and providing energy for the chemicals to react. After only a week, Miller and Yuri found that within the sealed chamber, several organic molecules had formed from the simple ones, including nucleic acids and amino acids, the building blocks of DNA and proteins. And it's just incredible to think that a handful of chemicals, billions of years ago would one day evolve to the point of not only consciousness, but intelligence and elegance and diversity to the point where today, microscopic single-celled organisms live alongside blue whales, the largest animals to ever exist, all sharing the same body of water where it all began.